things happening. Now I'm going to jump right into this because we've gone longer with some different things this morning. I'm continuing a series entitled Red this morning, and we're looking at the words of Jesus. There's a lot of ways you could go with this. What I'm, what I'm specifically focusing on is the seven unique sermons from Jesus that are in the book of John. So we've looked at a couple of those already, and this morning we're going to be in John chapter 5. <clears throat> we're going to begin reading with John 5 and 18. This morning I want to talk about the idea of searching or similar. The yeah, searching or similar. As I said, all of these sermons are a compare and contrast. Jesus says, you have been doing this. Let me show you a better way. You have, yeah, we talked about the first one was questions or truth. You have questions. Jesus says, let me show you truth. So we've gone through back and forth. So this morning, searching or similar. So Jesus has just healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. It's one of his most famous miracles but as usual, the Pharisees and the religious leaders are not happy about how Jesus is performing these miracles, about how he's conducting himself and his ministry. And so they begin to talk to him about it, and that gives us this, this sermon that is found in John chapter 5. So look, if you will, at John 5 and 18. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. 19, then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Look at that again. The son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever the father does, the son also does in like manner. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the next few moments you will speak to us. Your Holy Spirit has been here and is here. Let it fill every heart. Speak to us spirit unto spirit. We want to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The idea of the quest in literature is one of the most enduring themes or topics it's from ancient, ancient literature. Even at the time of the, of the Greeks, you have the voyage of Odysseus as he makes his way home from the Trojan War. That's, it's found in the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, those books. This, the, the quest of Odysseus to make it back to his wife. Years and decades as he sails back to where his home was after the Trojan War. You have, you have others like Jason and the Argonauts. We know this, their quest to find the golden fleece. For those of you that have ever seen the movies, they've made them several. Jason and the Argonauts, these group of heroes, have a quest to find the golden fleece. Then in more, more recent literature, not recent, but more recent than the Greek times, you have King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and their quest to find the Holy Grail. King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table were on a quest to find the Holy Grail in the, in the King Arthur literature. And then in much more recent, much more modern literature, you have things like The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy is on a quest to go home. And then probably the most, most famous quest of modern literature is Lord of the Rings, where the quest to throw the one ring of evil, to destroy the ring of evil, that is the quest, a thousand-page book about destroying a ring, which is basically it, the quest, the journey. That, that idea, that quest of searching for something, trying to find something, trying to accomplish something, that's what most hero stories are about, the quest for whatever. Most of us have that same quest in our lives, have that same searching, constantly searching for that thing, that thing that will fulfill us, that thing that will give us peace, that thing that will complete us. That thing that, that we need that will make us whole. That searching. So many of us, most of us, all of us are constantly on that quest. And it is this idea of searching that Jesus addresses in this sermon. Now turn, if you will, back to John chapter 5. We're going to skip ahead in the chapter and then come back to it. But I want you to see what Jesus says. Look at 5 and 37. John 5 and 37. Jesus is speaking and he says, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither 
heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Look again at the beginning of 39. You search the scripture. Jesus even references the idea of searching. Now, he says to the Pharisees, you're searching in Scripture for the thing that's going to complete you. But he says the law, the Scriptures will never complete you. The law simply points you to the person that will complete you. He says, but what you've done is you've dismissed that person. Look at what he says. But, 38, you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent. Because who? Because whom he sent he, meaning God the Father, sending the Son, Him, Jesus, you do not believe. So you search for meaning in all these other things, and yet you never look for the thing that will stop the searching. We do the same thing. We begin this quest, this search for completement, for wholeness, for peace. We look in all these different places. We do not, my feeling is, we do not, as the Pharisees did, search in the Scripture specifically. But I'm not dealing about searching in Scripture or not. What I want to talk about is the idea of searching in the wrong place. The first place that we search is we, believe, we begin our quest for wholeness, for peace. We begin that quest by trying to fix the thing that drives us the craziest. And the thing that drives us the craziest is us. We are the thing that drives us the craziest. Our own fault, our own mistakes, our own sin, our own past, our own pain. Now there is something, and we'll look at that in just a minute, there is something that gives us peace to that, that helps us overcome all of those things. But like the Pharisees, we don't want that. We want to search in all these other places. So here's what we do. We begin not to make real change to ourselves, we begin to identify ourselves as different than who we know we are. So be, first we begin to search in ourselves. We're searching in self. We begin to self-identify ourselves as something other than what we are. Now, before I go any further... I want to make it very, very, very clear. <laughs> I, am not, I am not getting into a whole discussion or sermon on any kind of self-identification when it comes to gender or sex. I'm, we are not going down that road, and that is not what I'm preaching on. I want to make it clear. I'm not preaching on that. Because here's the thing. You talk about this tiny, specific little thing, and then everybody else goes, oh, well, he's not talking about me because I'm not struggling. I'm not talking about that. That is an aspect of this. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is us self-identifying ourselves as what? Courageous, knowing that we're cowards. Identifying ourselves as spiritual, knowing that we aren't. Identifying ourselves, self-identifying ourselves as complete and whole when knowing that we're broken. Pretending to be whole doesn't fix the brokenness. Do you understand that? It doesn't fix the pain. It doesn't fix the stuff. All it does is make you pretend to everybody else. And what, what eventually happens? Eventually, you can no longer pretend any longer, and the entire house of cards comes crashing down on you. Self-identifying yourself as anything other than you are leads to nothing but pain and misery. It doesn't fix the problems. It doesn't fix the issues. What it does is makes us divorced from the reality of who we are. There is a fascinating video on the internet. It's older now. But there is a fascinating video out there that you can watch. In the late 90s and early 2000s, I don't know how many of you remember this during that time in television, but that gave rise to evening game shows. Game shows for a long time were not at night. They were relegated to the middle of the day and you, you know, Wheel of Fortune and uh, The Price is Right and stuff like that. It came on in the morning and the afternoons. In the late 90s, there was this renaissance of, of prime time game shows. It began with Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? 
Who wants to be a millionaire? And you ask questions, you answer questions, you answer enough questions, you become a millionaire. Regis said, is that your final answer, right? Everybody remembers that. That success of that show gave rise to all these other shows. One of them was Deal or No Deal. This is the entire concept of the game. You pick suitcases that have different monetary amounts in them. That's the whole game. I don't feel like you guys are following me. Millions of Americans watched one individual say, suitcase number 17. And we watched it by the millions, myself included. (laughs) How stupid are we? (laughs) Millions of people watched another person open suitcases. You could do that for free at the airport. But I mean, (laughs) that's what we did. So then it gave rise to all of these primetime game shows. Because game shows are cheap to produce, you don't have to pay actors, you don't have to pay for, you know, costumes and sets and all the rest of it. You just film it right there in the studio and that's it. You got a show. One of the most disturbing and and unsuccessful shows, it only was on for one season, I think, because most people reacted very negatively to it as I did and as most people did, and so it was only on for one season. It was a show called The Moment of Truth. I doubt that anybody in here even remembers it. But the moment of truth gave you the opportunity to, to win up to half a million dollars, $500,000. All you had to do was answer questions truthfully. They took a person, put them in front of a studio audience, and hooked them up to a lie detector. And then they asked them questions. And if what you said, the lie detector determined was truth, then you won that money for that question. Now they started off, you know, little questions, nothing. Just a yes and no questions. And then as they progressed, they got to a different level of embarrassing. Have you ever pretended not to have any money so you wouldn't have to help somebody that was homeless? They, the woman said yes. There's a particular woman. You can watch this show. She said yes. And she began to move through embarrassing questions. But then she moved from embarrassing to outright horrifying They asked her, have you ever stolen anything from your current job, from your current employers? Desperate to win the money, she answered yes. And the lie detector said, that response is truthful. And she won the money, having admitted to stealing something from the job that she currently worked at, which I can only assume as soon as the show aired, she no longer worked at. Her father, her mother, her two siblings, and her husband were there, sitting as close as I am to Courtney and a studio audience, hooked up to a lie detector. They then moved on to awful, awful questions that any sane person would refuse to answer. (laughs) On the day of your wedding, I promise you, you think I'm making this up. (laughs) Watch the video. Google woman on the moment of truth and watch this video. They asked her, on the day that you were married, Did you think that you might be in love with someone else? Her husband is sitting there. And she answered, yes. And the lie detector determined that was truthful. It got worse and worse and worse. The $100,000 question was, since you've been married, have you had an affair? I promise you, you can see why this was only on for one season. (laughs) Since you've been married, have you had an affair? And she answered, yes. And the lie detector determined that answer is truthful. And she didn't quit. And the $200,000 question was a fascinating little question. The $200,000 question was, do you think you're a good person? That's a good one, isn't it? They've already laid out all these things that she's admitted to. Do you think you're a good person? And she said, yes. Even though I've done all this other stuff, I do think I'm a good person. And the lie detector said, that's a lie. Can you believe it? She admitted to all those other things and then was unwilling to confront the reality in her own life that she wasn't a good person because it was a deception of self. 
She had convinced herself that, yes, I've done all these terrible things, terrible things. I've stolen from my job. I've cheated on my husband, but I'm still a good person. But deep down inside, she knew what? She wasn't. It's the deception of self-identity. What does Jeremiah tell us? Look, if you will, at Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. The heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceptive above all things. So what happens is we go on the quest for fulfillment and wholeness and completeness and peace and all this other stuff that we want and we decide how we get that is not by changing ourselves. How we get that is by pretending that we've changed. But deep down inside... The heart is deceptive above all things. And so no peace comes from that. No security comes from that. And as that woman on that game show, you walk away with nothing. Because I didn't tell you this. If you lie about an answer, you win zero. She admitted to all those terrible things and got nothing for it. That is the deception of self-identifying yourself as anything other than you are. It leads nowhere. It goes nowhere. There is no wholeness. There's no help. There's no hope. There's no completeness. It doesn't change anything. All it does is make you look like something that deep down inside you know you aren't. And people's compliments to you actually are daggers. Because deep down inside, you know I'm not a good person. And so the compliments, wow, look at what you've fill in the blank. But deep down inside, you know you haven't changed. You know you're not different. So you're searching in self. And searching in self does not give us the answers and the completion that we need. So what do we do? Back to John chapter 5. John 5 and now 41, picking up right where we left off. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. So first we, we search in self. We try to change self. Now we realize what we'll do is we'll change. We we don't change self. We're pretending to have changed. Now what we say is we're going to take on the characteristics of someone else. So we search in others. We begin to search in others. No longer, not still not wanting to change, to make real, significant, honest, genuine, authentic change. All we want to do is take on the facade of, or the characteristics of someone who is, you know, seems to be better than us, who we think is better than us, who we think is doing better than us, who we think is more successful than us, who we think is more spiritual than us. So we begin to look and talk and act and sound like that person. But that doesn't help us either because we're emulating, we're imitating another person, another human. That, I see preachers do this all the time. I am not, cannot be, have never wanted to be, have never tried to be anything other than who I am. I miss the point of myself if I decide to preach like somebody else. So I decide to become Dr. Mark Rutland Jr., right? So I decide to be just like dad. So I, you know, I start pronouncing words oddly. (laughs) You know that he does. You know that he does. You've heard him enough now over the five years. I tell him all the time, it's Matthew, not Matthew. How is it Matthew? I don't even, there's a W on the end. And David, David. How can you, how, it's David, David, not David. There's a weird 
on the first A. I don't even know what he's doing. He's talking out of his nose or something. Dive it. I don't even know how he does it. Right? So I start doing that. So I start pretending, but what? I miss who God calls me to be. Or I buy a super expensive suit, a very expensive tie. I grow my hair into a mullet, and I start talking about prosperity all the time, and I can be Joel Osteen. See, that's how that works. Super nice suit. This is your best life now. And I can have a little mullet and a little perm, a little home perm. And, and added, right? But what do I do? I miss who God has called me to be in this place. How many of us do the same thing? We decide, okay, I'm going to be like him. I'm going to be like her. And so we begin to model ourselves after them. Look, if you will, at Psalm 146, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Psalm 146, beginning with verse 3. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. Keep that one up for me. Go back to 3. Put not your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. Listen to me. Don't model your life after other people, spiritual or not. Don't model your life and don't model how you interact with people off of how politicians interact with people. Listen to me. Don't base anything you do off of what politicians do. (laughs) Holy cow. But just because, listen, just because they're opposed to it, they act like it, they do that, that doesn't mean that's what God is calling you to do with your life. We have, I, I, I I don't think I saw her here, but Sylvia runs our prayer team. So you say, I want to be spiritual like Sylvia and a great prayer warrior like Sylvia. So you begin to do everything that she does. That's not bad. Sylvia's wonderful. I love her. We all love her. She runs our prayer team. She's great. But her calling is hers and hers alone. You copying her doesn't help you find wholeness and completeness. It doesn't fulfill your quest. Your quest is yours. Pretending that you're healed, self-identifying as healed. I self-identify as healed and complete and set free. Except you got all the chains and bondage. That doesn't help. Pretending to be someone else, that doesn't help. That doesn't get you where you want to be. It simply makes you a poor imitation of someone else's calling. You have a calling. Being someone else is like making a copy of a copy. It never looks right. It's a copy of a copy because you're copying their call. Theirs is theirs. So we we search in self, pretending to be healed, but knowing that we aren't, pretending to be whole and knowing that we aren't, but that doesn't complete the quest. Then we try to be someone else, pretending to be this person that seems impressive to us, but that doesn't help because all it is is, as I said, an imitation of their call, of their destiny. So what, how does it work? Look back at John chapter 5 again. We're going to go back a little bit, as I said. We're still in 5, but I want to go back to verse 20. We read leading up to this, but we didn't read this. John 5 and 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these, That you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Jesus was similar to the Father. He was copying the Father. He said in the verses we read to open, I can do nothing without the Father. As Jesus models for us being similar to God the Father. He then calls us to be similar to him. You don't want to pretend to be healed and still be broken. You don't want to copy somebody else's call. What we are called to do is be similar to Jesus. As Jesus is similar to the Father, so we are similar to the Son. That is what we have to get in touch with. Who was Jesus? His ministry, his words, his actions, how he behaved, how he treated others. As he is similar to the Father, as the Father gives life to the dead, so the Son gives life. 
So that what? So that we can receive and point people not to us. I don't want anybody in here. Don't copy me. Copy, that's what Paul says. Remember, he says, do not imitate me. Imitate what, who I imitate. And who I imitate is Jesus. Don't copy me. Copy who I'm trying to be like. And who I'm trying to be like is Jesus. That is what our call is. As the Son has imitated the Father, so we should imitate the Son. And Jesus spells that out for us elsewhere. Look at John chapter 13. The same book, but turn over a few chapters. John 13 and 12. This is at the Last Supper. Jesus is washing their feet, the disciples. John 13 and 12. So when Jesus had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Imitate the Son who is imitating the Father. As the Father loved the Son and as the Son loved us, so we ought to love everybody else. We imitate the Son who is imitating the Father. As the Father gives the Son life, we receive life from the Son. We tell others about the life they can receive from the Son. He says, if you are my servants, the servant is never greater than the master. So if you are my servants, then you must do what I have done. And what he did was wash their feet and love them. We are called to be similar to Jesus. Now, you can continue to search. You can continue your quest as long as you want, but I promise you, you will never find the fulfillment, the completeness, and the wholeness that is found in simply imitating the master. Similar to Jesus. Connected to him as he did, so we do. As he did, as he talked, as he acted, so we do. And in being similar to Jesus, we find the wholeness and completeness that we have been so desperate to look for. So let me close with this. This past week, we were on vacation. Some of you may have known that. I wasn't here on Wednesday. We were on vacation. I often, we go on vacation between Sundays, so I don't like to miss Sundays. So we left Monday and we came back Friday. We drove to Central Florida and spent three days at Disney World. Me, Courtney, and Liam. The two older boys are out of the house now, so vacations are a lot more affordable with only three (laughs) instead of five. So much more affordable vacations. We can now afford to go to Disney World because I'm just taking one kid instead of three. So... Went to Disney World. We did the whole thing. We stayed on Disney property at one of their hotels, and we did three straight days at three different parks, and it was exhausting. It was exhausting. I'm going to go home and slip into a coma as soon as this service is over. It was just exhausting. But I say all that to say, as we were walking around the park, I don't know how recently you've been to Disney. I've never been anywhere on vacation where everybody buys into the idea um, that, how, how to describe it? Okay, for example, if you go to Six Flags, how many people do you see with Six Flags shirts on? Maybe a couple? Hardly anybody. Go to Disney World. 80% of people at Disney World have Walt Disney shirts on. Ears, hats, paraphernalia. It's crazy. Ads for, for, for rides, park logos, mice, animals, 
the park itself. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. You go to Six Flags, it doesn't look like that. They aren't wearing little roller coasters on their head when you go to Six Flags, right? I was thinking about it with standing in numerous, numerous lines. Numerous lines. <laughs> standing in lines and hearing all these different accents and languages spoken around me. Man, British people love Disney World, by the way. British people love Disney World. British people there, we won. There was a family from Brazil that was in front of us in one line, family from uh, Italy in another line. Everybody different. Everybody from their own place, their own thing, their own background, their own past, their own homes, but all of them coming together and all of them united in their love for a cartoon mouse, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. There were tens of thousands of people there. We were there for three days, three different parks. You know what I never saw? I never saw any fights. Never saw any fighting. Go to a sporting event. There's fights all the time. I never saw anybody fight. I never saw anybody, you know, you, you talk to each other in line. You, you, you don't yell at each other. Hurry up. Hey, the line's moving. Why aren't you moving? None of that. Because it's so different. But so similar. That is what this is supposed to look like. We're not supposed to be fighting with each other. We're not supposed to be angry with each other. We're not supposed to be yelling at each other. Well, you don't understand my past. You don't understand how I was raised. You don't understand my pain. We're all supposed to have Jesus shirts on, and we're all supposed to be happy and supporting each other. That's how this is supposed to work. We can do this better. It should be, dis it, not discouraging, but it should be a challenge to us. We need to behave as nicely to each other and the rest of the world as the folks at Disney behave to each other. That should be a challenge. Put that on the sign. Restoration Church, we're even nicer than people at Disney World. You know what I'm saying? Nicer than Chick-fil-A. That's what you really want to shoot for. <laughs> nicer than the employees at Chick-fil-A, right? Right? But listen, we're different. I understand we're all different. My friend Rico has a very different background and bring up than I. We're different. All of us experience different things. Our past, our present, it's all different. But listen to me, we're all united. We're all become similar in one great truth, which is as the Son imitated the Father, so we imitate the Son. And in doing that, we all become the same. We all become similar. If all of us are imitating the Son who is imitating the Father, then we all look the same. We all talk the same. We all act the same. We all love the same. We all support the same. We all believe the same. We all help the same. We, we, Jesus said, I am similar. He said, you guys are still searching. And he said, you search as long as you want, but you're never going to find what you're looking for. He said, I am similar to the Father. And as I am similar to the Father, so you should be similar to the Son. We all have the quest. We all have the quest in our lives for fulfillment and completeness and wholeness. That quest will never, ever be satisfied unless we become similar to the Son. As Jesus is similar to God the Father, so we become similar to Jesus the Son. And in doing that, we find wholeness. We find completement. We find peace. We find all of those things that we're so desperate for. Those are only found in modeling our lives after Jesus' life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together. God, we ask that each of us would become more like you this day and every day after. 
all of us, myself included, us individually, us corporately, we become like Christ. As Christ is like God the Father, so we become like Christ and receive life and receive peace and receive joy and receive healing, receive deliverance and freedom. All of those things that we're trying to find in all these other places, we find completeness in you. Help us, God. Help us to be similar to Jesus the Son as he is similar to God the Father. Help us all to run to you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray.